Hi everyone, welcome to Beyond Space Even at the Tundra. Our next guest is Diana Dragomir of the University of New Mexico. She is part of the team that has recently detected a new Neptune sized exoplanet, which re received designation TOY 1231b. Today, Diana will shed some more light on the discovery and the planet itself. So, without any further ado, please welcome Diana Dragomir. Hi, Diana. Great, great Hi, to have you to be and here. Uh, congratulations for the discovery. Yeah, thanks. If you um, so I should, I should just yeah. say that um, I'm not leading this work, right? So um, I'm a co-author on this paper, but uh, the, the work is led by uh, my colleague, Jennifer Burt. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about um, yeah. So what, what, what we've discovered. OK, in, yeah, yeah, about the discovery. How was it discovered? And, uh, the, and to what do we know about this uh, this uh, this alien world? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a that's a great question because the reason that I became involved with uh, this discovery uh, is because I'm working on a special uh, project within um, the TESS uh, mission, and what we are trying to do is look for transiting uh, exoplanets that only transit once during the test observations, because what that means is since we only see one transit, there must be at least um, something like 15, 20 days between uh, that transit and some future transit that we don't catch with tests. And so what that means is that the orbital period of the planet is quite long. Um, and so what happened with this particular planet is that my group uh, found it uh, as part of searching for those single transits. We found one transit early in the test mission. And so um, this one was going to be observed additionally with us. But uh, before we got the additional data, we actually started getting um, mass measurements with a different telescope to start characterizing its mass. Uh, and so in the end, um, it did transit again with tests. Uh, we observed it to transit again with tests. And we were able to get the period from that. So now we knew the period and we knew therefore um, how to use the mass measurements uh, at the right period to get uh, the mass and then the, the size from the transit itself. Um, so we ended up uh, with a nicely confirmed planet that way. Uh, but it kind of started as part of the single transit work and evolved into something um, beyond that. Yeah, so we need a, a test telescope uh, uh, to detect a transit signal, and then you should conduct follow-up observations to to confirm that it's uh, the signal has a planetary nature, and to, to uh, derive uh, all uh, uh, I mean ba basic uh, fundamental parameters. So, uh, uh, tell us uh, what do we know exactly about the parameters of this uh, planet? Its radius, mass, uh, orbital period, and something like that. Yeah, so that's a, a great question because this uh, this planet turned out to be uh, kind of like a Neptune. We would call it a, a sub-Neptune uh, exoplanet. Uh, so from TESS, we know that its size is about 3.6 uh, Earth radii. And we know from the mass measurements that the mass is about 15 Earth masses. Um, so overall, that's actually fairly comparable to Uranus and Neptune in both mass and radius. So what that means is that it's not a rocky planet. Um, it's probably, it has a lower density than a rocky planet. So it's probably a gaseous planet. Um, different from Uranus and Neptune in that it's actually a fair bit warmer than those planets. But it's also a fair bit cooler than a lot of the exoplanets that we're finding. So this one actually has a temperature of about 330 Kelvin. Uh, which you know we don't we don't want to use a habitable zone when we talk about this these systems uh, because it's being overused but it the temperature does uh, make it fairly cool compared to most of the exoplanets that we know of so that that makes it pretty unique but also it puts it in this um, region of space where it could potentially have liquid water uh, although since it probably doesn't have a surface like we think of planetary services any liquid water might be more like the form of rain, or more likely just water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, and that's what we're looking for next with um, follow up observations for our next step. Yeah, so, so we got a great target for follow up observation to determine its uh, atmosphere, right? So, uh, exactly. We learn yeah. About, yeah, yeah, about its atmosphere. Uh, do you assume uh, that 
what kind of uh, composition, um, uh, what kind of um, composition is its atmosphere? Uh, this atmosphere ha has. Do you, do you know? Do you can assume something right, right at the moment, or are any further? Um, further? Yeah. We, we, we can't, it's hard to assume because um, even the ga uh, gas giants in our own solar system are pretty different in terms of the various proportions of different gases that exist in their atmosphere. Um, but what we are hoping to detect is uh, water vapor. Uh, and that is interesting in and of itself, but it's also interesting because the water vapor then indirectly tells us, uh, interesting enough, how much hydrogen and or helium there is in the atmosphere. Uh, and then by determining how much hydrogen versus helium versus water, so how these um, molecules and elements, uh, which we do expect to find, but uh, the, their re corresponding, their relative proportions will tell us a little bit more about how this planet formed. Um, so that that's really what's interesting here and understanding how this planet formed, we can then relate that to maybe how Uranus and Neptune formed. Um, and say a little bit more about its history. Um, and perhaps, you know, so far we haven't seen other planets in the system. Uh, I would like to know why, why aren't there other, why is it alone? Is, does that have something to do with um, its history that we may learn something about from the atmosphere? Um, or is it just a fluke or, or what is it? Um, and I can add just one small detail, but it's an important detail. This planet orbits an M dwarf star which is a, a, red, a red dwarf star, right? So it, it's a smaller star than the sun, um, but astronomers like that because it's easier to study uh, exoplanets transiting smaller stars. Um, it's overall easier to see the transit. It's also easier to measure the mass, but it's, since it's easier to see the transit, we can more easily measure the atmosphere for which we need transits. Um, so the long period with the cool temperature and the small whole star, that combination makes this planet uh, fairly unique. Uh, it's also nearby. So, so for that reason, there's maybe one or two other planets that are as good to study as this one. And so the addition of this one to the sample is pretty valuable. So uh, summing up, uh, <laughs> it's a gazelle, gazelle giant, um, uh, not, uh, I don't know, I'm not able to, to sustain uh, life, so it's not a good place to search for alien life, uh, something like that. <laughs> or, or can we uh, well, yeah, microbial um, life? Is, yeah. So that's an interesting point. It might have a moon. If it has a moon, then I suppose um, you can imagine that moon is terrestrial. Um, but a lot of this is speculation, and we don't really talk about it in the paper for that reason, because it's just almost imagination. We currently don't have any evidence that it might be a moon. Um, there is a recent work that just came out a couple of days ago uh, looking at whether you could have life in the um, temperate atmosphere of a small gas giant or a small Neptune-like planet like this one. And um, in theory, it could work. There are a number of obstacles for life to, sur to, um, to surmount in a, such a situation. So it's it's difficult because um, the mixing in the atmosphere would bring life, would bring um, microbes deeper where it gets hot. Uh, and so they have to kind of find a way to survive and feed themselves up high in the atmosphere. Um, so it, it does bring interesting questions on, on that topic. But I think life as we know it on this planet, uh, I would say it's fairly unlikely. Um, that said, the more atmosphere an exoplanet has, the easier it is for us to study that atmosphere. So while we are working towards finding more terrestrial planets and studying their atmospheres, uh, knowing that that's actually a very hard thing to do, we like studying those um, Neptune-sized planets because they're actually perfect. They have lots of atmosphere, makes it easier to know what's in the atmosphere. And maybe we can learn a little bit more about smaller planets in the rest that way as well um, and then we like small planets for potential life but it's just harder to study so we've got we've got to find a balance yeah okay diana thank you so much for this um, for all the answers we have provided for for this interview um, it was a pleasure to host you on our show thank you so much and good luck with your thank you thank you thank you bye all right